right, guys, welcome back to our podcast, episode seven. Uh, today we have our director of sales, Omar Subi, and rookie of the year, Monique Belgrave. Hey. Monique, to, to kick things off, what? we have your rookie of the year WWE belt, which is oh. pretty badass, too. Wow. So, <laughs> which I, I, okay. it worked Thank out perfectly. <laughs> yeah, we were just going through the closet and we remember that we had those from, uh, from last year. So, you got to wear that proud on all of your appointments. That's definitely something that makes sure you're on, your that. yeah, on, on the shoulders. That's a good conversation. On the piece, shoulder. For sure. um, no, you can throw it down here. You don't have to leave but it congratulations, you earned that. Thank you. Yeah. So Monique's, Monique's somebody who came into our world. You were licensed in January. I want to say you started to really get momentum in April or so of this year is when it started to kind of take off. And I feel like you got confidence behind it. Um, and since then, we'll get into the numbers of where you're at close this year, um, your goals for 2024. But I want to take it back. We were just talking about Subi, Subarus. <laughs> and when you had first reached out to me, I don't, you know, feel free to go into it as deep as you want. But I remember you saying that you were in the car business, mm -hmm. Hurricane Ida, did a number yep. um, and you kind of found yourself in a scenario where it was really sink or swim, right? So, so what was your background? I mean, what took you to, to this point? So I have 10 years in the automotive industry. I was actually owner operator, um, independent dealership in Hasbrook Heights. Okay. So bought, sold retail, wholesale, everything mm -hmm. from A to Z with a beautiful team, family oriented. We just from A to Z got everything done. Um, did the financing, did the sales, did the advertising, did everything. Yep. And then, like you said, Hurricane Ida came. Unfortunately, we were underinsured, so always get your insurance. And they didn't cover the loss in terms of the vehicles that we had in our inventory, so it was start over. Yeah. Wow. And it was something that I needed to find, something that was gonna give me the ability to make the same amount of money doing the same amount of work and not costing me as much time. Yeah. So that's when I thought about real estate. No. Spoke to our dear friend Ralph, yep. and he pointed me in the direction of a couple different um, real estate teams, and I interviewed. And I would always tell my family, like, which one are you going to go with? So I was like, okay, just because I'm in the car business, I've interviewed with some teams that I would say are the Hondas, but the Socorro team, now the Alime team, was the Bentley of it. There we go. So I went with the well, Socorro group at that time. I was going more Rolls Royce with it. <laughs> No, Bentleys are cool. What's the Flying Spur, that four-door one? That's I'm a like one. an uh, Ferrari SF90, I think. <laughs> it, you know this. You get Omar going on cars. It's just the we SF90 is the only, yeah, that is the only uh, vehicle that matters to, to Omar. <laughs> or GT2 RS. <laughs> GT2 RS, too. Yeah, he's got, he likes his cars. They just have to be very fast. Of course. But no, That's I could right. definitely do, I could do like a four-door Flying Spur. That could be my, my uh, family vehicle, the family. Flying Spur. Okay. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good like minivan for myself. But um, no, I mean, I was in the car business too. And I was talking to um, Chris Pareto about it when we were on probably a month ago or something. And I was saying one of the things that I never liked about the car business was I felt like, and this, again, I didn't own my own shop. I worked for Nissan. So I had sales managers as like the checks and balances and closers had to come out. We had a whole process that we had to follow, which go figure, you follow their sales process. It actually worked. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem was you were in that world, trying to get as much money out of the consumer's pocket, trying to get them on the highest payment, taking them through finance. They used to use the term cracking them. Like I hated that. Yeah, like no, let's, cr oh that. no, you give them that lease and then we're gonna crack them in the finance booth. And I'm like, this is just not what I wanna be doing. So fortunately for me, 2007 was what wiped that industry out with the Dow dropping and everything got really bad. So I was kind of forced with my back against the wall to get back into real estate, which I had already failed from at that time. Um, you know, but with that, that that's what I liked about real estate. I mean, you're really you're watching folks transact, buy their dream home, mm -hmm. or buy a home, a starter home, whatever it may be, or buy a multifamily or a condo, and you're actually watching them like make smart financial decisions. That even if the home isn't worth as much next year, or if anything changes like that, it's never it's never a bad thing because a lot of our clients, a lot of the folks that we work with are trading up. So using that as an example, and we had to deal with this in 2007 when I was licensed, if you're purchasing a property today, and let's say in five years it's worth 10% less, I don't think it will be, but a lot of times you're upgrading. Like a lot of our clients are buying their first or second home and then they're going to the next one. So if the next home that they're looking to buy is 1.5 million and it's worth 10% less and they're selling a home for 700,000, that's worth 10% less, it actually works out in their benefit. Right. Um, so that's one of the things that I always focus on. And I, I really love the, the building wealth component of folks owning real estate around us. And now we're at you know, a point where Eric Eckhart, you bought your home. Do you, you know, like people are buying homes around us on our team and it's like, 
yeah it's really what makes my heart sing yeah no it's i mean you get to a point where you know you you talk about interest rates and all that but at the end of the day if you need a home you need a home it really yep. doesn't matter so and i think that's kind of what you've started doing with your clients is educating them enough on what that home buying process is and what that does for you so like can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing to get your clients you know you're leading them to water obviously you can't force them to drink it but you're showing them how to drink it yeah so i like to go through the process um i like to be a resource so when they're coming in a lot of people unfortunately this is their first time so i like to take it from step a to z i do it in the driveway i do it on the phone just as soon as i get that first meeting and we broke on the ice and i see what you like or what you're trying to do i go from a to z so i explain you know we're going to do this we're going to see some properties as we're seeing the properties i want you to tell me what you like and tell me what you don't like so that i can begin to eliminate some and then add some new ones so i build a relationship with them while telling them okay once we find something we're going to make an offer and you know this is the first time that we actually get to negotiate price there's sometimes there's three instances when we get to negotiate but when we make the offer that's getting it away from the public then i go through what that goes like with the back and forth possibly a counter maybe we need to come up maybe it needs to be a highest it's a highest and best scenario so i just go over the different possibilities for getting the property to come off the market and then we talk about the attorney review and how we have a team that we refer you know whether it be for your lender or for your attorney that we have a team of resources that we utilize and i just go through everything and they are at that point they're like i didn't know this nobody's taking the time to explain this to me great how do we get started so you're doing that with, I would say, probably every single client that you're getting, regardless of where they're at in their every you know, client. buying process or stage in life or yes. whether they're upsizing, downsizing, you're taking it upon yourself to go through that process again. Yep, because even if they're upsizing or downsizing, they didn't buy a property last year. The market's completely different from what I'm being told. So I want to make sure they have all of the information at hand so that when we're going through the process, of course, I'm going to repeat it, but it's not going to be the first time you're hearing it. That's awesome. And one thing you touched on was, you know, you're telling them we're going to make an offer. What does that look like? Why are you doing that? What's this? What's the thought process behind it? Because I like that you're kind of priming them to, you know, say, we're not just going to be out looking for homes. If you're serious about buying, we're going to make offers. So yeah. how's that worked out for you? It works out great. They have that expectation of, okay, if, especially if it's the highest and best, like I have to put my best foot forward. I, Monique can give me all the market data that she wants, but at the end of the day, it's what it's worth to me. So if I want to go crazy above highest and best, I will. If I want to stay you know, close to the asking number, they're going to do that. But I give them the opportunity to make the decision and I prep them for like, look, we're not going to get the first property. Maybe we will. We might not even get the property at the number you're asking because there's negotiations that can go back and forth. Just so they have this expectation of, okay, it's a process and I need her to help me get it. I can't do it by myself. That's awesome. And what are you doing to get them that information to help them make that decision? So, you know, if, between talking to the listing agent or talking, you know, to the whoever is doing the mortgage and things like that. So definitely pairing them with our recommended lenders so that we have a pre-approval in hand. And then when it comes to that point where we are making the offer, I'm speaking to the listing agent. I'm Kikiing, hey, listing agent, what does your seller need? Oh, great, I noticed this. Just getting all the questions that my client may need to have answered. And then I go back to the client, like, look, this is what the listing agent told me. This is the market data. This is where, I, I mean, after I give them that, I say, well, where do you think you'd want to be for this? They give me a number. I'll either, you know, talk with you or James, see if that makes sense. And then I'll either push them to go a little further or then I bring in the part that it's not necessarily just about the number. It's about the terms, too. Right. So maybe you're not as aggressive in the number, but you're putting down a higher down payment or you're able to move in quicker. So I just give them the whole story. We put together how we're going to make the offer and then we submit it. And then I follow it with the agent and I'm like, hey, it'd be a pleasure to work with you. Here goes my client's offer. Let me know what we need to do to make this work. So you're kind of building that relationship with the listing agent to get as much information as possible. You're showing them that you care about the client. You're in control of your client. You're not just throwing an offer at them, hoping that it gets accepted. You're just saying, hey, my client is that serious. I'm building that relationship with you. I'm following up with you. I'm asking all the right questions. Here's the full package. This is what you asked for. Correct. Awesome. And they, they usually appreciate it. And if we don't get the offer, they'll tell me what we could have done differently, especially if it's the highest and best. Sometimes it does come down to the number um, and it'd be a far off number. And then, you know, the, ne the ironically, the next time that person has a listing and I call on it, they remember me. They're like, hey, Monique, yes, it would be a pleasure. This is what I need. I'm trying not to do a highest and best. So if your client's interested, let me know now. And then we can try to get it off the market as quickly as possible. What's your at bat for offers accepted on the clients that are submitting offers? I don't know. I haven't. 
I don't know. It's pretty damn high. I mean, you I started know. what? Seriously in this business in May, I would say? Actually, my first, like, seriously was June. June. Like, I took off in July. So. That, that um, Independence Day weekend, I did a bunch of showings. And then from there, it's just been nonstop. And how much volume are you going to do this year? I'm hoping to close 12 deals by the end of this year. Worth about? Maybe a little under $10 million. There you go. Which yeah. are already in pen, like they've already either closed and they're pending. They're it's pending. not like you need to find new contracts. No. We just need, we need the attorneys to, to shoe it, it through by December 28th. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I want to touch on is you've been pretty um, religious with keeping a very clean CRM. How are you doing that with all the showings that you've been on? You know, you're always on top of the leaderboard with phone calls, emails, text messages. I, I mean, I, I'm assuming you're probably doing this on the go, on the fly, on your laptop. So the beautiful thing is FUB is available on your mobile. So I'm answering calls. Um, so one thing that I do is I'm all about task. Every time I have a conversation with a client, as soon as I hang up the phone, I know the next time I'm touching bases with them. And most of the times in my task, rather than it just saying follow up, it'd say confirm Thursday's appointments, check on surgery, ask about xyz property so there's something for me to do and i can look at it and get it done so it saves that time of having to go back and look at the notes or listen to the calls but my fub is i'm in it religiously if you look on my phone it's probably the most used app on my business phone so 100 i'm in it emails you know just going through making sure that no one falls through the cracks sometimes over the weekend things will get a little bit busy a new lead will come in monday or maybe even sunday night i'm doing a recap just to make sure i didn't miss anything and i know what my week looks like going forward and you've been pretty good with, you know, keeping a pretty clean funnel. So now if I ask you where's your next business deal is coming from, what are you, where, where are you looking? If I'm looking in that section A. So if I look in column A, it's <laughs> going to tell me the next 30 days. So, so you're pretty well organized to know, you know, your clients that are A under 30 mm -hmm. are in a certain bucket. So you go and take a look at them and say, hey, those are the ones that I need to focus on that I can move down the funnel. Yep, those are the ones that I'm checking in on a, on a not a daily basis, but a weekly basis, just yeah. to see what we need to do next. Um, I'm, I have one client that I've been working with since, I want to say August. I speak with her like she's my friend, like on a daily yep. basis. I saw this, I saw that, but she's in tunnel. She's in tunnel A, so I'll make sure I call her on Monday. Happy Monday! What are we getting done this week? It's almost a new year, so. On that note too, I mean, when you came in and you really took off, well, first off, the 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 call May and really having the organized CRM is is like. Goldfarb's graded it too. Like yep. knowing exactly where your next deal is coming from. Andrew Cassie and I were working on that um, in the spring. I think he had 20 people in like his A column and we had to filter through and say, all right, who should really be here? Let's move new folks in. Let's go hit the B and C list. Let's hit our nurtures. Um, but when you were building that up, when you were in July or you were in June or the months prior, I remember you were going through the ponds, right? You were going through older leads and stuff too that were already in our system that yep. were raising their hands. Mm -hmm. And then cultivating those what was that do you still go back into the ponds do you still work on the older stuff that's sitting there like tell us a little bit about folks that you've transacted on that i feel like a realtor's already passed up the opportunity on so i'll go back into the crm um i'll look at the notes check and see what the last conversation whether they said they were moving to long island or if they were just pausing for the summer because they were traveling and then it's hey how was your travels over the summer and they're like hey who is this i'm like hey it's monique we spoke on such and such um, you were going to Spain. How is that? Did you get to see your daughter? And they're like, oh, great. Yeah, I remember. And then it's just a matter of, are you ready? And then they're saying yes. And then we're seeing properties. And because I've already um, kept the rapport, or followed up with them, they're comfortable. So it's, okay, is it this one? Is it that one? Or what are we doing next? So do you have a lender that you need to speak to or that, you, that we need to put you in contact with? And then we can proceed with making offers and getting them to the closing table. Being still new yet having so much experience in this year um have you noticed a difference of having our preferred vendors on on properties with the client having a nice experience versus just willy-nilly and landing with you know some random person from ohio yeah um i have this one deal that's just been a thorn in my side she's not using any of our vendors she's not using any any attorney lender nothing and it's I'm like every day at the skin of my teeth, like, is this going to make it to the, t I don't even count it anymore. Like, is it going to make it to the closing table? Because she's all over the place. The lawyer, all over the place. Like he's uh, all over the place. I don't even want to bet. He's a great lawyer, what he does, but he doesn't do real estate law. So it just makes it more difficult. So anytime we have the option of at least having our preferred attorney or lender or both, it makes it 10, 10 times easier. Yeah. Tremendously. Because yeah. you can call them at any given time and say, hey, I need this done. And you know, it's done. Yep. 
versus, I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with that on, on a deal that I have where the attorney doesn't respond for a week at a time. And it just makes me look bad to the client, makes me look bad to the lender, the listing agent, everyone in between. So you're having to kind of like backtrack and apologize for their shortcomings, you know, yep. and making your life that much more difficult. Yeah, on this one, I had to email Darren. I'm like, Darren, can you please ask this attorney to, like, they haven't even asked for commission checks yet. Yeah. They were supposed to close on the 14th. How is this happening? Yeah. So. <laughs> it's always fun. <laughs> always fun. Yeah, unfortunately, I have a lot of horror stories. And I feel like the folks that we know that we do operate with are usually, they've come into our world because they've cleaned up so many messes for us that yep. we're like, okay, <laughs> we can't ignore you because you've saved so many deals for us, for our clients. So, right. um, no, it's a huge thing. So. When we were at our holiday uh, get together last Wednesday, mm -hmm. I asked you how many homes you want to sell in 2024, <clears throat> and I liked the number. You did. Okay. Throw that out. Let's I hear thought it. it was. I was like, okay, did I did I say too much? Okay, so the number the goal is 45. 45. 45. 45. So so right now, what my goal was, Love what, it. I, the, what I was doing was, I either had to, because I have this, the the emails on Fridays are important to me. Just I love to see my name on there. I love to see new people's name on there as well. So it's a goal. Either I'm I'm getting an accepted offer a week or I'm closing a deal. Yeah. Like I think there's only been last week and this week where like I think there's only like been two weeks where I haven't been on the paper when I haven't been in the email. Yeah. So that's like once I'm either an accepted offer or a closed deal, then I'm on my, I'm on target. Yeah. She's going to be on uh, <clears throat> this Friday's email with like three or four deals. So I love it. And honestly, too, if anybody's that's one thing we started doing probably three or four years ago. And if Darren, like the week of Thanksgiving, didn't shoot the email out, I sit there. I'm like, that's my like heartbeat on the team. I love <laughs> watching that. But what we do for anybody who's a team leader that's watching we or anybody who's an agent on a team, we shoot out a, a weekly recap every Friday that shows our pending volume, the agents who have written deals so far that month, um, the new deals for the week, close volume. We have our Chicago and um uh, Chicago New and New Jersey team broken out on it. And it's just, it's cool. It's cool. It kind of, it gives you that push. Actually, in the car business, when I was there, we had a huge whiteboard and you could, that's where I got it from. So you could see they would move like the, the magnet pieces out on this big grid and you could see how many people in this, this dude, Washington would sell like 30 plus cars every single month. And I'm like, I'm gonna go be, I'm gonna go be Washington. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I love seeing it. Cause you're like, I remember we've, you know, we've had some months where, Certain agents, I feel like even yourself, you've had five deals up on the board in maybe August or was it July? Yeah. But um, I think the most, I, I don't think I've ever seen an agent go over 10 in one month on our team, but I've definitely seen like the no, seven, No, we've eights. seen, I think Kevin Cassie on his top month, um, I could be wrong. I think he had like eight or nine, but nice. 10 is a target. So That's, I'm going for it. I'm coming for it. I'm coming for your eight or nine, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me. But yeah, if you get 10 under contract in January, that's a good start to 45 January. in 2024. I have it paced out. So yeah. it's like, I have it paced out. Between listings and buyer side, I have it paced out. Yeah, that's the one thing that I wanted to touch on too. You've been really good with, you know, the clients that you have that are on the buy side, they're getting them to list homes. So what are you doing there? Like, what is, what is that conversation like for you to open that door to say, hey, I know you're moving from, you know, somewhere down south, relocating to somewhere in Bergen County, how are you getting those listings? Well, I honestly don't give them a choice. Like if you're already, if I'm already working with you and I'm showing you properties and we're getting along, why would you even consider somebody else? Like why right. would you do that? Right. So when we're talking, okay, so when are we going to list your home? When can I come by and walk through it so that I can get you paperwork so it can get on the market? Yep. Like it's not even an option. Like we're, let's get this done. Right. Yeah. And you're saying it with confidence that Just they're like, like that. oh, this girl is going to sell my house. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's going to happen. Right. Let's, awesome. Let's sign. Well, I feel like too, when you're, you're mentioning it, regardless of where the client wants to enter their offer on a bidding war, it's, it's entirely up to them. Mm -hmm. But I always think that having any offer going through the motion of it is, is great for the consumer to really feel like, okay, this is what it feels like to be in the game. Now let me play all out round two or round three or something like that. And that's the same with the listing too. It's so many folks are, they're hesitant on putting their property on the market because they haven't found that next home. And it's very easy to, to go through the motions, and actually have that ready to go. And it doesn't even really affect them that much if they're on, or let's say they decline an offer because the next property wasn't available or whatnot. But I find that if it's, it's, I don't I want to say, I have never had a scenario where I listed a home and they didn't end up selling because they couldn't find the next place to go in right. 16 years of doing this. Nice. So 
it really is. It's anybody who wants to be serious needs to get that home ready if they need to sell that to get to the next property. Right. And then I give them the options like, okay, maybe it's not going to happen. You know, you close in the morning and you buy the, the afternoon. But I, we, you guys have taught me that there's resources, there's bridge loans, there's, you know, probably you'll rent for a month. So I just give them the options if we, if it comes down to the point we can't find a replacement, yep. but we should at least get the property on the market if you're serious, especially now. You get creative with it and you figure out a way to make it work. If yeah. they're serious, then there's a way for everything. Right. Yeah, my sister and brother-in-law, Maplewood's one of the nuttiest towns, Maplewood, Montclair. They're just tough to, regardless of any market, they're tough to find properties. And what we did was sold their home, got them a use and occupancy for 60 days mm -hmm. post-closing. And it was included in the offer that they put out. Um, and by the time we got, I mean, she was literally like delivering her third kid. The whole thing was a crazy, hectic thing. But we were able to then, we were, I think, a week from closing on the property that we were selling. And because of that, since we were so far along and me knowing the realtor, Robert Northfield, great experienced guy, I was like, we have a contingency, but not really. Right. And here's why. And he was like, okay, great. Got that offer accepted. And then they closed, I think, 40 days later. They were able to exit that other property, you know, 20 days before the use and occupancy was up. Buyer came in early. Everybody was happy. But really juggling, like, this, this is all doable. We mm -hmm. can do this. We just need to follow a plan and actually discuss what is the scenario so we can write this, the uh, prescription? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, we've got a pretty much a solution for every situation that comes up. It's just a matter of getting, you know, if you have control of your client and by control, I mean, you have, you've built that relationship and trust with mm -hmm. the client. So when you offer them something and say, Hey, this is going to solve a problem that you might have, they're fully on board. And yeah. you've done that pretty well, I would say with, for what being six months in the business. Actively. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. But it, it comes down to the resources that you guys have provided too. Like the training, great. Like it's given me the confidence to have a conversation that might have with someone that might have purchased three homes, but now I'm coming in brand new. They don't have a clue. Like I usually tell them after the fact, like, hey, by the way, this is my first year. And they're like, I couldn't tell. Yeah. Like I've gotten that with agents too. Like that's I have this awesome. one agent that's like, yeah, you're lying. You're, you've been doing this for a while. I'm like, no. That's awesome. Yeah. Happy to hear that. Like, no, I'm not lying. Your ecosystem just sucks and you should come <laughs> party with us. Right, definitely. Come on over. <laughs> no, but that's like one of those things. We always say, hey, we're going to give you the information. We're going to help you feel as confident as possible throughout the transaction or throughout the process, clients, whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, we need, we need the agent to move. And that's what's nice about what you're doing is you're actually, you're moving through the CRM. And I have, Jen Schiff always says it. I've never seen somebody who doesn't run our playbook and not have success. 100%. And that's a thing that I wanted to touch on too with you. I, I think you know your numbers pretty well. What is it going to take for you? Like how many calls do you think you're going to need to make in 2024 to hit that target of pretty much I would consider it four transactions a month to be safe to hit that number? I don't, I'm not sure. I, I don't know that I don't know. Because you break usually I call you and you break it down. You're like, oh, I can see that you have about 10 more deals here because of the, the law of this number. And I'm like, okay, I'm working. Yep. So you can tell me. <laughs> so you've got it all in the CRM. That's something that we're going to sit down and talk about in business planning that we're doing this week is we're sure. going to break it down and see if, if you did on average, say, a thousand calls this month mm -hmm. and a thousand calls got you three deals, then we can figure out how many calls you need to make to get your fourth deal. Okay. Right. So we'll talk about that and we'll reverse engineer, but you're using the CRM to its fullest potential so we can do these things. Right. Okay. And that's, that's when it becomes really fun because if you say, I want to do 90 deals, what are we going to do that? We're going to look at the CRM. Or do 45 and double the price point. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but that too, like I was on a, I was on a great Zoom uh, with the folks at eXp on Friday and we had a top agent on with us and he was saying, he's like, I only I'm at a point in my career, I only focus on a million and up. And it's not because I want more zeros on the paycheck. It's because the consumer is more aligned with like what I am about where we are in life and that sort of, like he's big on the investment side of things and whatnot. Right. And that too is it's, it's so nice that in this world, what you focus on, like what you go after is what you're going to get. So if you're going to work, you know, 800 plus thousand dollar condos in Jersey city Heights, cause I know you've already had that listing and stuff and that's, that's what you're going to become. You start moving towards it and that's what you actually become. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very simple business that gets Yeah, elevating the price point is a lot of fun when you... Yeah, you did it. Yeah, when you start looking at it, like year over year, you just say, okay, well, my average price point was X. 
how am I going to get it to Y? And once you really put it in the back of your head, you do it. You just figure it out as you go. Okay. If you, and if you know your numbers, you're going to figure out exactly where that's coming from. And we'll de- take a deep dive into that. But that's probably going to be something that's going to be helpful for your business next year is, you know, elevating that price point. Once we look at your average price point, getting that number up is really not that difficult. Exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's a fun way to do it. He's done it. Goldfarb, who's coming on next, too. He's the king of uh, higher price points and travel in the world. So. Yeah, I feel like Goldie this year only did deals a million plus. <laughs> yeah, he's nice. like 1.8 1. million, or I'm not talking to you. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. But but yeah, no, It's it, there's a lot of folks that have done that. And I feel like that, that to me, like, again, talking about simple things, to me, it's easier to sell 45 homes per year at double your price point than it is to sell 90 homes at your current price point. Yeah. And and like for me, I'm big on quality of life. What, how do we get more time with family? How do we, um, you know, how, do, how are we able to take a deeper dive with all of our clients and give them 110% of ourselves? Whereas, you know, certain ways you start to spread yourself a little too thin. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, a, that's just a great way to really, you know, build a deep customer um, route. You know what? Actually, on that note too, and I'm just going to throw it on here. One of the things I was thinking of, we're always talking about sphere of influence. Um, one of the things with sphere of influence that I was thinking too is a really good test to see where you are with your sphere of influence or your past clients is how many referrals have you sent to agents out of the, you know, outside of our area that you've received a referral commission on. Right. Because that means that if somebody's looking to buy in Florida, you've created such a relationship with them, like this person you're talking to every day and mm-hmm. they're moving out of the area, that they're looking to you as their beacon, even if they're outside of the state, to pick the right realtor for them. And I feel like that was just just a side note, but it's something no, that I was thinking pretty, about. Yeah, yeah, no, that's pretty cool. I mean, if they trust you that much to you know come to you for advice. Yeah. I had a, one of my best buddies lives in Utah, and he... Uh, we're talking about a couple of transactions that he had. He had a tenant in one of his properties and just running like some scenarios through me. And that's, you know, that's your sphere of influence. Yeah. So if they ever move somewhere else, they're going to be reaching out to me to say, hey, how can you, you know, connect us with someone that we can trust? Yep. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. I had somebody just recently call me about asking if I had an attorney I could recommend in New York City that knows tenant laws yeah. very well. Yeah. So. Um, and I basically said, you're screwed in New York because <laughs> I own in New York and it's not a fun state for tenants or for landlords. So cool. Well, um, we're getting close to wrapping up. So, you know, looking forward, playing all out 2024. Um, really appreciate you, you know, being a part of this organization. I really feel like you, you bring a lot of energy into it. You really uplift things. You've got your WWE belt Thank now you. too, which is just, that doesn't get better than that. Um, selling 45 homes is cool, but having a WWE belt is even better. So congratulations <laughs> on that. And uh, I look forward to having you back on. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. and I have one last question for everyone that's tuning in. What, for you as a newer agent in this business, what would you? what's your advice, number one tip or two tips that you can give to a brand new agent? How do, how do you get your business to where your business is at now today as, as quick as possible? Be consistent, have a great team, rely on their resources, just have a plan and stick to it. Like some days you're not going to want to do it, do it. Just stay consistent, honestly. Awesome. So consistency is the number one key. Okay. I think what I heard her say was snap and next and cash and check. <laughs> we didn't bring that up, but it got brought up. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Monique. Okay.